Hey guys, and welcome back to the rest day with Jack Haig. In this episode, I was on the massage table with my soigneur, Nick. He's been looking after me this whole tour de France, and we had a bit of a chat about what his role is in the team, how the tour de France has been going for him. Um, but I need to apologize a little bit because I didn't bring the most amount of energy. Yesterday was stage 15 of the Tour de France and it was basically almost seven hours once you include the warm-up and then the ride down to the bus after the finish of the stage. And today I'm rather fatigued. But I've had a pretty good rest day, to be honest. It's the second rest day of the Tour de France. Not much happened. Luckily, I did get to see my family because we're in Carcassonne, which is about two and a half hours, three hours away from Andorra. So my family came down and I got to see them this morning and have a bit of a catch up with them which was quite nice we did about an hour and a half on the bike i think i averaged about 130 watts which was about as much as i could do today because my legs were rather sore we unfortunately didn't stop for any coffee so i can't report on the cake situation but i had a nice mushroom pasta for lunch and then hopefully tonight I'm about to go and have a very good dinner, but that's about it. Again, need to apologize for the energy and maybe it's an incredibly boring conversation that we had, but I hope you find some of it somewhat insightful and I'll try and catch up with you guys again at some point before the end of the Tour de France or just a bit of a recap once the tour is finished. Enjoy. All right, I'm here with Nick, my soigneur. Welcome to the rest day, Nick. How are you? Thank you, Jack. Uh, yeah, good. I mean, for us, rest day is not really a rest day, you know, it's a more a non-travel day. As you've seen, we were quite busy in the morning preparing for the, for the following stages. You know, rest day is also a opportunity to have a more thorough uh, look into the cars, cleaning, uh, you know, cleaning all the cool boxes, preparing new bidons, bottles for the for tomorrow, extras for the day after. So quite busy, but uh, less stressful, you know, without traveling and everything. Before we get into too much else, um, I'm rather fatigued today. We did uh, a very hard stage 15 yesterday. I think uh, in total, it was almost seven hours once because we started straight uphill and we had the turbo trainers out to do a bit of a warm up and then you had the neutral. And then not only did we finish at the top of the mountain, we then had to ride back down to the buses. And then we drove about two hours after the stage to get to the hotel. And where are we? At the moment, yeah, in Carcassonne. In a beautiful Campanillo. <laughs> True. Also, <laughs> it's uh, not... sad that the, your listeners or our listeners can't see. Uh, yeah, our deluxe room setup. So it's not all uh, Hilton's and mm. uh, Four Seasons hotels in the Tour de France, unfortunately. Now, as part of the soigneur duty, you also give the massage, and then normally the massage happens in your room, and you normally share a room with another staff member. This time, it's Ziga the mechanic. Yeah, but sometimes you need to get a little bit creative with how you fit a massage table into a small French hotel room. So at the moment, we're in. It's actually a rather new Campanello, so it's not so bad. But we've got basically the two single beds pushed as far apart as possible and there's just enough room either side of the massive table to fit about half a human luckily nick's a pretty fit <laughs> specimen so he fits in there well um but yeah it can be a little bit difficult sometimes to do massage inside hotel rooms what's the strangest thing you've had to do with a hotel room to manage to fit a massage table for oh, good question but I mean, during this tour, as you mentioned, we were quite lucky, but uh, sometimes we have to put, uh, let's say, one mattress on top of the other mattress 
and then uh, put the the table on me, sorry, the, the bed like next to the wall. Yeah, or... like flip the bed up next to the wall so there's enough room. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, can be a bit of a, a Tetris game in the hotel rooms. True. I was quite good at that when I was young. <laughs> so <laughs> that's an yeah. advantage, you know. I Perfect should put that job. in a CV. <laughs> good at Tetris. <laughs> Um, now, maybe to discuss a little bit what a soigneur does and how many soigneurs there are and how you split the roles while we're at the Tour de France, because it's a little bit different to other races. Obviously, it's quite a bit longer, but we have eight riders and how many soigneurs? So, in our team, we have uh, five, sw five soigneurs plus uh, the osteo. Yeah. And then you're also... Not only massage therapists, do you also help prepare a lot of the biddens and the food for the riders, as well as the food for the staff sometimes, for the directors in the cars during the race. You also split the roles between doing uh, the hotel, so transfers between the hotels, as well as, yeah, the feed zone. So I think for the first week, you were on hotel transfer. Sure. So at the beginning of the of the tour or i mean already before heading into the tour de france we split our uh, roles and responsibility for during the tour uh let's say uh for this year's tour de france i'm here like a elite uh, soigneur which means this was kind of my responsibility to speak with sport directors and organize uh, what we do and how we do so um we split our Swaneur's team, let's say, into two parts. Um, two masseurs, they go uh, directly from one hotel to next hotel. So let's say uh, we call this a hotel uh, masseur or hotel Swaneur. And then the other three, they go to the race. One one of them, uh, let's call him, a, is like a stewardess, you know, like a bus uh, masseur. So, he assists uh, to you guys during the transfer from hotel to the start and then from he's doing the finish line and uh, again he's at the bus for the transfer from finish to the next hotel. The and the other two guys that are also uh, on the race, they, uh, they go same from hotel to the start area and then to the feed zone, official feed zone, extra feeds, whatever... Uh, it's in a daily plan, let's say. And uh, yeah, so if we go a little bit more into the details, normally the guys that are doing hotel to hotel role in the morning, they prepare um, uh, lunch bags for staff, either a wrap, a sandwich. On the days like today, you know, um, that we had uh, more time, uh they already made i think pasta for tomorrow or is it maybe a wet wedge rice i'm not really sure we'll see tomorrow uh and but then yeah they try to leave as soon as possible to the next hotel to reserve the parking do the check-in for the whole team for the whole like for riders and staff put the suitcases in the in the rooms uh pillows uh all that kind of stuff and the lunch bags you make is basically for all of the staff that are at the Tour de France with inside the team. Because yes. all the riders, we get, well, we don't really have lunch, I guess. I guess we get like uh, the, lunch. <laughs> the feed bag and then a uh, post-race meal on the bus. But obviously everyone else that's part of the team is part of like the traveling circus. So you don't actually sit down and have a proper lunch. You get basically, yeah, a takeaway bag that you guys prepare. Yeah, exactly. So normally, yeah, uh, we only, yeah, even like breakfast, we eat at the different times because every, every department of the inside of the team has maybe a bit different schedule, you know, so like it's hard to that we everyone meet in the morning. Basically, only, only dinner is at the time when we all can sit together and eat as a team. But then, uh, yeah, during the day is uh, a lunch back and, yeah, mixed of fruits, some bananas, apples, maybe some yogurt. And then, as I said, sandwich, uh, wrap, something. Yeah, you, like you, you need to 
rotate a little bit, you know, it's still it's 21 stages and uh, you can get fed up with uh, sandwiches, so... Ham and cheese sandwich, yeah, 21 days that. in a row, Ooh. gets pretty old. What time does uh, your day typically start, actually? I guess it depends on every day, but like on average, more or less, when are you getting up, having breakfast? Do you have time for yourself? Yeah, it depends on, uh, let's say, on the schedule, what uh, what time we have to leave the hotel. Normally, we meet um, two hours before departure. Um, let's say myself, I try to wake up earlier to do at least something for myself to go for a run. Because basically, before breakfast is the only time in the day where you can go out and do something for yourself. Uh because it's it's long days i think sometimes people maybe don't realize but like you guys basically work from almost sunrise until very late into the afternoon and evening like you guys have dinner most days around 10 p.m yeah so you almost get no time to have any sort of personal time and i guess for a lot of guys the easiest thing to do is do a tiny bit of sport and that's normally running because you just need yeah. to running shoes yeah so I think you guys normally go for a run quite early in the morning, depending on the Swanier or depending on the staff member. Yeah. And then, yeah, you're pretty much quite busy from then, yeah, two hours before we leave. So if you leave at 10 a.m. from sort of, yeah, in the morning till very late in the afternoon because you do massage and you normally do two riders per Swanier. Yeah. And each massage is normally around an hour long. So there's two hours already gone in the evening and then we're normally lucky enough that we go straight to dinner after massage, but then you guys go back out to the truck and prepare things the next day. We could easily say that, yeah, we are maybe the first one awake and the last one going to bed. Yeah. Us and the, let's say the chef and his assistant, they have yeah. quite a, True. a long uh, day as well. True. Now, maybe to broaden our topic how many days a year would you normally work with the team uh i spent around 180 days per year with yeah. the team let's say between 170 and 180 in our team this is a let's say a typical for a full-time uh, contract we have some guys inside the team that have less days but yeah for our full-time uh, uh role is almost half of the year yeah traveling around with you guys now maybe to bring it back to the tour de france uh we're lucky as riders that we have a beautiful kitchen truck a chef and a sous chef that look after us for all our meals but you guys eat all your meals in the hotels and sometimes the food especially in france can range from being quite nice to being quite average now uh What's the best meal you've had so far this race? Best meal so far? Huh. Well, I won't count yesterday's barbecue because this was like a teammate, you know, like... Yeah, so maybe to, to explain <laughs> more, maybe traditionally on the night of the last stage of the week before the rest day, the staff always organize a barbecue outside. I think you guys had quite a nice barbecue with the... Football, yeah, TV. the football final. We have also some Spanish uh, staff members, so yeah. So, excluding barbecue night, best meal so far? Hmm. Well, I mean, if I need so much time now to think, then uh, <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know. Huh? No, but like. Worst meal then. Can you choose worst meal least? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, worst meal was probably just some like, uh, yeah, mm, maybe the mashed potatoes one day were not really brilliant. We were like questioning ourselves what they like, what do you put inside to make it so bad, you know? <laughs> but like, no, but. At the end, I must say, I must to be fair also to the, all the hotels we've been so far was quite okay. But um, nothing no. exceptional or nothing super bad. So to, average. To be honest, I have the feeling that the last couple of years, the hotels and the Tour of France are actually 
much better than they used to be. Yeah, they it, stepped up a bit. And especially much better than, for example, uh, Criterium Dolphinae or Paranese, where you can sometimes get some pretty average hotels and the staff normally don't get the nicest food there. Um, now, part of the job is also giving us the feedbacks in this race, which can actually be kind of a bit of a, a scary and daunting moment for both the Swanier and the rider, depending on the speed that we come into the feed zone area. And it can be a bit hectic with so many Swanier's from each team. So normally in the feed zone, you have two Swanier's per team trying to hand out these feed bags with two bottles and a bunch of food inside and actually weighs quite a lot. And if we come through at speed, it can actually be uh, a little bit scary and a bit of a, a mess. Have you had any bad experiences in a feed zone? Um, well, not really bad, bad, but you know, like sometimes when the rider either misses the musette or like he drops the musette, then you're like, ah, shit, did I do something wrong? Or was maybe, maybe he was not uh, paying attention, you know, and trying to take the musette last moment. But luckily I haven't been involved like in any, uh, that you would, you know, like crashes at the feed zone. But yeah, as you said, sometimes with with uh with fast approach windy days you know like you're standing there and you're thinking like hmm is he really gonna take it you know like especially i don't know like some of the climbers about dj breadstick yeah. when he takes the two kilo musette uh yeah you don't know like like whew. exactly and what do you put in the feedbacks actually and so we also have uh, never second as our nutrition sponsor but you guys also prepare some snacks for us so maybe you talk about what we have in the feedback and then the snacks you prepare okay so let's say um we have a traditional or uh we have a team brain victorious musette content so we always do pretty much the same we put inside uh three never second uh, c30 gels we put one um, C30 caffeine gel, one energy bar, um, and then two bidons, which yeah can change from day to day, depends on a stage. It can be uh, our rocket, so a C90 drink, uh, just a plain water or a, a C30 malta bottle. And then uh, we add uh, Krispies. Yeah, I guess that's your favorite and uh, a small uh, can of Coke, which is always nice, especially on a hot day, one nice cold cola, and uh, an ice sock if it's super hot. Maybe explain what a crispy is, because this is a maybe relatively new thing in cycling, because previously we always had uh, rice cakes, which is sort of just white rice cooked and then mix together to make kind of like a sweet rice bar wrapped in aluminium foil. But in the last maybe two or three years, this has sort of disappeared and now everyone's using Rice Krispies. What is a Rice Krispie? So Rice Krispie yeah, is again like a rice cake, but with the dry uh, uh, puffed rice, uh, basically you, you start with um, melting coconut butter adding uh, marshmallows uh, we add also fructose and then when all this together melts you just uh, add like uh, the kellogg's crispies i mean it can be yeah, any other yeah, brand yeah, that, uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. like just this puffed rice you mix well together uh, you can add also a little bit of agave at the end uh, that it's not too dry and uh, then you just um yeah Pull all this together in one uh, zip bag, flat out, like gently, not pressing too much that it doesn't get too hard. And yeah, just wait that it cools down and you can basically cut it one hour later. We also dip it in a, in a coconut flour because then it doesn't stick to the aluminum too much. Yeah, so basically we've been developing different types of Rice Krispies over the past maybe year, year and a half. And 
we have a couple different flavors and then we also have the problem of them sticking to the aluminium foil and then it becomes really hard to eat in the race so yeah the coconut flour on the outside helps with this and we also tried to make them about 30 grams of carbohydrates per rice crispy which is then in line with all the other food that we basically have so it becomes easier to calculate the amount of grams of carbohydrates we use per hour and you've actually worked with the year for how many years um, I started in uh, 2015, um, so first, um, uh, okay, a year before already, 2014, I worked in a continental team. I was, uh, I actually graduated from University of Sport, so I started as a coach for juniors, but then a year after, I got the opportunity to join uh, Team Sky as well, as a Swanier. And uh, yeah, since 2015, I'm in the World Tour traveling around with the best riders in the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the Rice Krispies are relatively new. How, what else has changed and like, ha, have you noticed any big differences, not only in your job, but just in cycling, having worked inside the sport and for teams the last couple of years? Um, yeah, I mean, in general, I think all this attention to details you know like aerodyn aerodynamics uh uh changes in training and then i think just the the way of racing itself i mean you probably notice this even more but, yeah, but, uh, just... but maybe more related to like your job so like in the past i remember when i first turned pro it was all about the uh, rice cakes, paninis, jam, cheese, and ham inside a little panini. Whereas now it's almost uh, no teams using this anymore. Now it's uh, everything really scientific and uh, measuring, you know, all the, as you said before, the grams and uh, uh, also with the hot weather protocol, like, you know, how to cool down, uh, having uh, all. All, all the possible equipment at the bus for a better recovery with, I don't know, game ready unit and uh, uh, the recovery boots. And uh, yeah, the other teams then they use like um, the, the cold buffs. Yeah, all this. I think now there's basically no limit anymore, you know. But the problem is all these new innovations, a lot of that is extra work for you guys so is your job got harder uh i would say yes i mean the days are longer yeah yeah i, I think you know like as we before at the beginning of the podcast we were speaking about the hotel to hotel role uh, at the past this was probably in the past this was the most uh wanted role you know like everyone oh no i will do the hotel you know they were saying like 15 years ago in wealth that they were fighting like who will do the hotels because it was basically just uh, leaving the suitcase in the room and then they went to the swimming pool. But now, like, uh, yeah, it's not like this anymore. Do you miss the old days a little bit, being a little bit more relaxed, not having to measure as much things and not having to be so sort of stressed and precise? Um, to be honest, like, uh, as I mentioned, I, my first team was Team Sky. And in 2015, I, uh, I would say that we were already doing a lot of this stuff, you know, like we were really searching for the marginal gains and uh, doing uh, more than other teams did uh, eight, nine years ago. So I must say for me personally, I was, you know, like thrown into a, a really, really professional team straight away. I didn't experience this um, uh, romantic cycling in the early 2000s, you know, because uh, let's say I'm still pretty young in my job. Talking about the marginal gains and working for Team Sky, do you think now, obviously Team Sky were quite dominant in those earlier years, do you think now that's what's happening with Visma and UAE that they've now sort of unlocked the next step that Team Sky did back in 2015 to 2018 where they were by far the best team 
maybe because of all of these extra things that they were doing. Do you think that's now shifted and now Visma and UAE are starting to do that and other teams are needing to catch up, even in EOS to an extent? Uh, by the results, everything looks <laughs> like that, yeah. Um, no, I think like, yeah, every team, I think, tries to do as best as they can, depending on their budget. Yeah. And if we look teams' budgets, yeah, I mean, it's pretty obvious that some teams have inside the World Tour, the winning teams or the best teams, they have like triple amount of budget of the lowest teams. So, so it's a big difference inside the uh, World Tour teams. So maybe as a psych, as the athlete, we maybe don't notice so much the budget difference other than maybe the salary and the contract that we get with a team. But I imagine as a staff member and especially as a soigneur that deals with hotels and going to the supermarket and getting food, did you notice the difference between working in Team Sky with back then what seemed to be a bit of an unlimited budget to then coming to work for this team, which has uh, quite a smaller budget compared to that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, it's not like that we are... Um, no, it's not like we're, we're poor we're, or we don't, yeah, yeah. we're cutting corners. But like you were saying before, there is a difference between the budget of UAE, Visma, Ineos compared to, say, maybe the bottom eight teams in the World Tour. And I'm just wondering, like, did you actually do you notice that difference? Is it uh, noticeable? Like when you go to the supermarket that it's now a bit more of an unlimited thing, you just buy whatever you want. Or if you need an extra set of normal tech boots the team just buys it without even questioning it whereas maybe here there's things that you would like to do or things maybe you talk to other soigneurs and other teams you're like oh, i'm nice actually uh yeah i mean let's say the first i wouldn't uh, say we are so extreme you know like with shopping yes yeah. but uh, equipment wise staff wise you know like the amount of stuff you have uh at the race and all this uh this for sure you can notice yeah our like amount of the vehicles i think we are still on uh our team is still on in the uh first half yeah but then let's say some other teams uh you can see they have less stuff than we have and i don't know the other extreme is uh uae here that has nine swaneurs yeah at the uh, tour de france so, uh, <laughs> and, and this is actually, like one is not even doing a massage. Yeah. This is something that you actually also really notice as like the rider, especially in these really hot days. Cause something that maybe people don't understand is the way that we get bottles now is less and less going back to the team car because it's actually quite hard to go back to the team car and more and more getting bottles from the side of the road from normally soigneurs or team helpers. And you see the teams with the bigger budgets they're able to have more staff and then more bottle points on the side of the road for when it gets hot for ice and water. And it, in the end, it makes quite a big difference. So maybe that's where you see a bigger difference in the budget rather than, for example, the, the recovery boots that they might have an extra pair or something like this. But yeah, definitely having more staff and more hands to be able to do all the jobs that you guys do. Exactly. Yeah. Like also the the jobs after massage yeah, you exactly. mentioned before i don't know just with cleaning cars uh, yeah you know like doing bottles uh you don't need to have a, a phd you know for doing bottles and cleaning cars an extra pair of hands yeah. is really useful and not only is recovery super, impor super important for the athletes also you guys like it, in the end it's four weeks we spend away more or less and if you spend four weeks every single day going to bed at 10 11 p.m even midnight and if you can reduce an hour or an hour and a half of work, you guys work much better over the four weeks. And that's where extra staff can really help to do those more simple jobs, like you're saying, like washing cars, mixing drink bottles for the next day, preparing the feed bags or preparing the lunch for the directors and all this kind of stuff. Exactly. Laundry, all this stuff. Yeah. Ah, it's another thing. You guys always do our laundry as well, which is something I think a lot of the writers take for granted that we just basically do nothing for four weeks and everyone around us <laughs> does everything for us like our laundry like our cooking like our cleaning like our our everything now maybe to finish this up you have any funny stories you've worked with a lot of cyclists you've done a lot of massages is there anything that jumps out that even from a training camp experience or maybe 
What's your being your favorite training camp or your favorite Tour de France? Um, let's say my favorite Tour de France. I like we don't have time that I'm thinking here for I'm no, no, ten just, minutes, but just for fast. sure, you know, like you say, you never forget your first one. So yeah. in 2015, I was a uh, it was my first Tour de France, and Froome you won it. So for sure, this I will remember forever. Uh, my favorite training camp location, yeah, Tenerife. I really like it. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, our location it's pretty boring. Again, yeah. like we are uh, uh, under the volcano all alone. Yeah, it's like a prison, but um, it's for a nice me- prison. Yeah, it's a nice prison. <laughs> it's probably one of the best views. Yeah, but uh, it's one of the camps where you can do also um, a lot for yourself. Yeah, you're a staff time. member. Yeah. You know, you guys are doing crazy hours of training, and yeah, you can also just put your shoes on and you go for a hike, run, whatever, enjoying the the altitude. All right, Nick. Thanks for the chat. And now we need to finish my massage. And then I'm going to dinner and to sleep because I'm very tired. Thanks, Jack, for having me. Enjoy. <laughs>